Hey you guys, David Helpling here. I posted up on social media asking you guys which song from Rune you would like to see unraveled in a reveal video. Um, and what I was saying by that is I was going to show you the mix session and go in and take it apart and let you hear the individual elements and show you some of the secrets that I use to process my guitars and to mix my music and how I make my music. So I think every song on Rune, which is eight songs, got votes from lots of you, but the clear winner was the song, The Heart of Us. So that is the song today that we're going to dive into, and I'm going to show you all of the elements. Um, it's going to get a little detailed, but I think there's going to be something for everybody. I'm not going to play the entire song all the way through. I'm going to play it in chunks and reveal things to you. So um, thanks for tuning in, and let's check it out. It's really cool that you guys chose this track. It's one of my favorite tracks from the album. I think towards the end of the production process, uh, because the last two songs I finished for the album were Glass and this one. Um, so these two are still really exciting for me. It's not that I don't love all of the music, but they're still fresh and resonating with me. And this one is, has a lot of beautiful stuff that I still am excited about. As you can see, it's very simple. Um, if you're not used to looking at a mix session, there isn't a whole lot of tracks in here. And, and it's pretty simple, which is a little deceiving because some of these individual elements that start at the top required an entire session on their own. So um, if you know this song, you're going to hear a lot of elements that you've listened to over and over. If you haven't heard this song, open a new tab on your browser and find The Heart of Us and give it a listen and then come back and watch this. I'm not going to play the whole song through. I'm going to start at the beginning and just reveal individual chunks. So uh, here we go. The very first thing you hear in the song is this sort of bending of notes that um, go from seemingly random places and all resolve to a chord. And that entire event was created in another session and uh, the individual parts were recorded live on guitar. Just as everything on this record is all guitar, no synthesizers, no samplers. So the first thing you hear sounds like this. Now this kind of goes forever, seemingly, um, so we're going to stop it right there. The kind of sound and processing that I achieved on just this one event is a completely new kind of production style for me, and it was really fun. This entire album was built for me just having fun and pushing the limits of what I can do with my guitar work and trying to really make it sound like the music is happening underwater. And that is the concept of this album is that everything is waterborne and I wanted it to be very clear that all of this music was happening underwater. So this is the session where I created that intro event. It was recorded with three different individual riffs that start from one note and bend and resolve to another. So let's go in here and check these out. So I'm gonna isolate these and just play each one. The first one sounds like this. It's a low note and bends up to a resolve and it sounds kind of whale-like, which was the intention. The second one sounds like this. Uh, that's cool. So that one started high and bent low. And then the last one, which is uh, sort of sitting on top that you probably recognize the most, is this one. So you put all three of those together, and they sound like this. So I was really happy with that. That was the sound I was going for, but they sounded small and thin, and I wanted something that had enough body to carry the first three minutes of the track. So the first thing I did is one of my favorite tools, big shout out to Valhalla DSP, is the new Valhalla Delay plugin. And in this case, what I'm doing is putting this Valhalla Delay on the, the master bus for all three of these, and I'm using pitch shifting to create an octave lower. So let me turn this on and you're gonna hear it. 
um, with the original and a bit of this lower pitch. Here we go. There's a ton more dimension, depth, um, warmth, and power when you do that. If you take this and turn it all the way up, if you just want to hear the lower octave, it sounds like this. which I just think is magical. I love that sound. I think I have it mixed in at about like 70% or something. But um, this is a really awesome tool, Valhalla Delay. You, you get it into pitch mode, and what I did is a ping pong so that I'm creating some depth in the stereo field, but this is very important. You see, I turned the width way down to like halfway. Everything in music these days, especially in my world, is really wide everything's happening on the outside and I really wanted to create a sense of depth of field so there is something in the distance coming towards you so collapsing stereo fields and creating more of a monocentric sound that blooms into a stereo um, effect is what I find really exciting and I think it makes it feel more organic and I rolled off a lot of the low end because this gets super boomy and super muddy really fast I took all of that and then after the delay, I added one of my favorite reverbs, which is also from Valhalla DSP. And this one is called Shimmer. In this case, I'm just using this to create space and time um, and to get some texture and grit. Um, check this out. This is with everything on. So that's the entire event, and it maybe lasts about 30, 45 seconds. And then I mix this down to one stereo track and brought it into my main session. So let's go back, and I'm going to show you what I did with the rest of it. Now comes the real magic for me for what is happening in this track. As you can see, I've uh, collapsed it to one stereo event, but there's a ton of automation going on. I'm not going to go into every little thing that's happening. Um, this whole walkthrough is already going to be pretty nerdy. So I'm just going to show you a couple things that are really important to what made it work for me emotionally. So the main thing I did is I took yet another Valhalla delay, but this time for a completely different purpose. What I did is I put this Valhalla delay in a tape mode. Um, he actually calls it hi-fi, but this is a sort of tape delay that has enough fidelity to give you everything from the bottom end to the top. But it does an amazing thing when the sound feeds back and collapses in on itself over time. It becomes really, really special. And um, I took an event that happened in maybe 30 seconds, and using this technique, I took it out almost to three minutes in the beginning of the song and it is ever changing and it's really cool i'm going to turn this on and you can see that right now the mix is at zero percent so we're not hearing any of it some of the automation that i put in here is actually slowly increasing the amount of delay over time because um, i really just want to hear the original event first but i have the feedback set to 103 percent so technically that's going to go on forever but because this is a modeled tape delay it does really special things at a high feedback setting it's really cool so uh, just listen to this real quick so now it's just starting to emerge from the sort of the mist of that original event. So now it's become this completely other thing that's out in the distance, in the ocean, if you can imagine. And it's becoming more and more um, overdriven. And the sound is getting smaller, but more focused at the same time. Uh, it's just incredible. So let's talk about this real quick. Fab filter. I want to do a shout out to Howard Givens, Howard at Spotted Peckery. Thank you so much. When I started working on this album and I decided I was going to produce and mix it all myself, um, I talked to him and he really recommended some of the Fab Filter plugins. And this Pro MB is just unbelievably accurate. 
and musical for the kind of stuff I'm doing because it's super precise. It's not emulating some 70s piece of hardware. This is a tool to get something done to solve a problem. So what this does is this is a multi-band compressor. So what I can do is I can compress just one frequency band. And in the beginning of this, there is a lot of buildup in the lower mid-range. So we're going to use this to, to push that down when it's powerful, but then to let it go and to let it all back in and to be really full in the sustain. And you'll see uh, how ridiculous uh, it is. Oh my gosh, that's like 9 dB of gain reduction but you never hear any of the compressing or the release, and now it's back. It really helps bring a fullness to everything without me having to EQ all of that stuff out of the sound. Um, and then in post, I've got another little dip, which you can see is going down because I automated that because I was having some buildup around 500 hertz, which happens all the time. 500 hertz in ambient guitar is always a problem. So that's what it took to make this entire event. So let's go to another session and show you something really interesting. That entire opening event is seen here in blue and I have this turned off. Um, what we're gonna talk about now is some of the special kind of music that happens in this track between the intro event and the actual melodic and chordal emotional part that comes later. I have a technique that I call whirlpooling it's kind of like looping, but not. It's an ever-changing, continually evolving um, whirlpool of sound. So I'm contributing sounds to it. And over time, those sounds are going to get quieter, darker, and they're going to disappear. But this is over a really long period of time, like five or six minutes, seven or eight minutes. Um, so the cool thing about what I'm doing now is everything's happening outboard on the pedal board, but I get to record all of this stuff on the computer, have the whirlpool happening live, but I can still go back and isolate some of the original events and change the time of them to really sculpt the experience of a full orchestrated song. So all the stuff you see in green here are just individual riffs that I contributed to the pool. What I'm using for my Whirlpool is, once again, my little buddy, the Valhalla Delay. So in this case, I'm using the mode digital, and it's 100% wet because I'm just having this delay on an aux on my mixer. So I'm just sending all of these improvised guitar phrases and textures over to this Valhalla Delay. Um, so we're hearing all of these original events, but then after a while, they start to come back. Um, and you can see that I have the delay time set to eight measures, and I'm at 100 BPM. So I don't know the exact math, but eight measures at 100 BPM is a really long time. And my feedback is up really high, like 97%. Now, there's a lot of very careful settings on this delay to make this work the way it does. A feedback of 96% versus a feedback of 98% is the difference between something going away really quickly and it hanging around just long enough to sort of collide and weave and intermingle with all the previous parts. So it, it gets really tweaky, but when you get it just right, it is magical. So in this session, I'm going to show you two other elements that are being created. One of them is the Whirlpool itself, which is kind of the mother track. And the other one, is the sort of sun track, which I call Mistress Space, which is an, uh, an offspring of this, but in a completely different um, textural design, doing a completely different job, but it is all derived from this. So let me just start at the beginning, and we'll get a couple phrases feeding into the Valhalla delay, acting as my whirlpool, and we'll let it build up just a little bit. So check this out. Nice and quiet, right? Because we're waiting for it to come back around. So 
now you're hearing the very first little collisions that are happening between only three phrases. And I've got some volume automation because some of these were a little out of control. So already, the very first phrase you heard of those couple of harmonics are already significantly darker and quieter, and on each repetition are going to get softer. I think this is the signature phrase right here. So that's the phrase that really sets up the cadence and the progression that is to come. And I love how all of this stuff just happens kind of on accident. So you're hearing that phased reverby sound. That's the very beginning of the mistress space I was talking about, which I'll show you in just a second. So if we zoom out, this goes for a long time. This entire whirlpool that's being created takes five or six minutes to finish adding everything that's being added to the pool and then it's just a case from there on out so i'm not going to go on into it if you guys know the song you sort of know what happens but um once again valhalla delay is just making some things possible that were not possible nine months ago seriously there's nothing else out there that does what this does like it does so i'm going to stop it and even though my session stopped, the Valhalla delay is just going to keep churning out that whirlpool and it's going to get darker and warmer and more homogenized over time. So fun to play with. I wish there was a pedal that did this, then I could do it live. Anyone makes a pedal like this, let me know. I'm on it. I've got an aux send from this whirlpool track that is going through a massive channel strip of stuff. And I'm going to go through really quick and show you what it takes to make the mistress space. First thing I do is I have a, a Valhalla shimmer that I'm adding a lot of uh, feedback to, which is a higher octave pitch shift. So it's adding an octave higher in addition to all of the other stuff that's in there. So you're hearing both in the reverb and it's a, I've maxed out the decay time. And you have to be really careful with the modulation depth. All of this stuff is over the top. Very careful settings will yield very musical results. But you crank this stuff up too much, it just becomes muddy and a mess. And um, you start to lose the musicality of it, for me anyway. So I've got one of those. And then Phase Mistress is a plugin from Sound Toys, which I love everything they make. So I've got this super slow modulation. If you see this little blue line here, um, I've got a really slow LFO that is actually taking all of this reverb and phasing it slowly over time. So it's getting darker, and then it'll take a whole minute to, to open all the way up and get really bright and open. It's almost like it's breathing like a tide in the ocean. So it's perfect for this kind of thing. And then after that, I'm using the Isotope Ozone Imager, which I absolutely love. Stereo imaging is not something to take lightly. There are so many of these, and some of them just don't keep all of the sound intact in the right way. And stereo panning and stereo law is a giant um, universe into itself. So you can see that I've taken the entire output of this Valhalla Shimmer and the phase mistress, and I've collapsed it way down to almost mono. If I bypass this, actually, let me just put it back up. 
This is what's actually going on. There's absolutely nothing in the center channel. Everything is on the outside. So there's no depth of field. There's no front to back. And if you're listening on a hi-fi stereo system or studio monitors, you will really hear the dimension that goes from front to back. So we're going to pull this way in. I think it was like 70 or something like that. So now we can go out of that to a stereo delay. And this is another one from Sound Toys, Echo Boy Jr. I'm only using the junior version because it's easy. I can just go bam, ping pong. Um, it's a dotted half note. I can, it's barely mixed in there. It's like, uh, yeah, 22%. So this is taking that sound we've created with mistress space that's in the middle. And we're hearing it bloom from the center to the outside every time there is an event. And the phase mistress is shifting the tone over time, but the Echo Boy Jr. is really letting it go um, far away to close and from center to side. Um, and that creates the dimension that I feel makes me want to crawl into the mix. It makes it really interesting. So after that, I have a way super ridiculously aggressive EQ. Um, so back to FabFilter, um, I talked about the Pro Multiband earlier. This is the Q3, which is one of the most precise and surgical EQs I have ever used, but it is super, super clean. No color whatsoever. As you can see, I'm rolling off all of the low end. I've got a really healthy dip at, uh, it's like 800 Hertz or something. Um, a little dip at a uh, 500, which is always happening. And then in this particular case, because of the phase mistress, it was putting out all this upper mid range that got really sort of um, harsh and telephonic at times, depending on the LFO sweep of the phaser. So this really lets me reel in the output of everything that's happening in a way that is not going to take up the entire mix. Cause this is just, one of three things that build up the track before the real music even starts. So it's important to let each of these elements um, sit in their own little niche in the mix, but not take up the entire mix. Because then we just have a bunch of collisions. Now, of course, after we've cleaned everything up and got it close to center and put a little delay on it and EQ'd it, at the very end, I put another Valhalla shimmer on it because I'm a shimmer addict. It's just a great reverb, especially for ambient guitar work. Um, in this case, this guy, I'm not using very much of the high octave feedback. I think I've got it at 104 here. My mix is at 49%. Um, and when you're making a record and you're in production, the difference between 49% and 50% to me is something I can hear. All of these careful settings is what it took to make this be as beautiful as it is. Um, if you ever end up using Valhalla Shimmer in this type of situation, it's really important to look at your low cut and your high cut settings. I've got my low cut all the way up at like 300 hertz because I don't want all this boomy, bassy mud coming out of it. So um, that's it. This is the Mistress Space and this is my massive um, signal chain of processors it took to make it happen. So let me just stop, and go back. So that's the last sub session that I'm going to show you guys. I'm going to close this up and we're going to go back to the mix session and get into the song and really hear the music and reveal some of the other guitar and bass instruments and some of the really big stuff. These three big guys here are the things that I just showed you. So this is the intro event of those bent notes. This green guy is the actual whirlpool um, after it was bounced down to one stereo track. And it's super cool. Check this out. You can see how it started off as these individual events and they started repeating and repeating and things were added. You can actually see the waveform become more and more of something else. And I love that. So right around here is I think where we sort of let go of the whirlpool and just let it run and decay. And that's the mother track of the mistress space, which is this light blue guy. And you can see that um, for creative reasons, I took the mistress space and actually 
moved it earlier by about 16 measures because, um, you know, I had this sort of idea to design this concept of this particular song. And I wanted to end the album in a way that was really big and really ambient, but in the second and third act did something really profound. So it was important to let some of these things enter in a very, very subtle way so that you never really, as a listener, you don't hear this intro event go away and you never specifically know a point at which the mistress space became so present. And you definitely never hear when the whirlpool, all this guitar work became such a big part of the song. So it became a very careful dance of just getting everything to to play along. Um, I'm not going to play it all because we're going to get to some of the more important parts of the music. But um, there's a moment in here that I do want to play because there's a specific moment where things just become magical. And I probably get more excited about this than some other people, but I still, I have to share this with you because it's really cool. Um, so I'm going to go back just a little bit and I want you guys to hear um, the sort of moment I'm looking for is probably right around here. Let's see where my uh, guide is, but let's go back. Listen to how we go from this dark intro event, which is slowly decaying over three minutes. Um, and then these other elements are slowly sort of coming out of the mist. And at one point it becomes something else completely, which I love. So check this out. There's still a big warm presence of that intro event. And the Mr. Space is just coming in just a little bit. really hearing the mistress space almost more than the whirlpool itself but you still hear a lot of this intro event happening and we still haven't got that one little signature riff i was talking about it's coming up so there's a bloom that's happening right now So all of a sudden now that that event that took us into the song and introduced us to this undersea world is gone and we're in full full ambient mode i'm going to stop it right there but um i get really excited about this stuff so i'm going to turn those off so you can hear what comes next uh one second let me just collapse these so these green guys here are harmonic strums and they're aggressively processed because I was trying to achieve a certain sound that I love. Um, I'm really leaning on my influence, which is, in this case, is U2. And there's some specific stuff on the album, The Unforgettable Fire, that is just, to this day, is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Just some of the most amazing guitar tones I've ever heard. So I tried to capture that with um, these harmonic strums. But by themselves, they sound like this. And in this particular one, I actually strummed the harmonics, held it out, and then at the very end, I, I used the tremolo arm to let the pitch fall. I don't even know if you, you hear that in the song, but I'll do it one more time and listen to the end. It sort of goes down right there. And each one of these harmonic strums creates a different chord. And together with the bass guitar notes, that's when the music really starts to happen. So if I was to play these events by themselves, um, it sounds like this. And the bass is huge. I'm actually taking my bass guitar and putting a little bit of a subharmonic synthesizer in there to get an octave lower than the bass note. Um, and on these first four bass notes, I'm actually sending to a shimmer reverb because we're still out in space and there's enough room to hear that. So the bass by itself sounds like this. Man, 
I love that sound. Another thing to talk about on the bass, um, I'm using the console one from Softube, which is a hardware software combination. And on this track, you can see I've got a lot of different stuff happening all across my mix. Um, and the great thing about the console one is you just put a console one plugin on every channel and you've got an input section, um, a gate section, an amazing EQ, a really beautiful compressor, and then a whole drive and character circuit, which is very reminiscent in this case of the SSL 4000 series console, which for what I'm doing for guitar and stuff is great. Um, but on the bass really quick, let me just find it. Um, I've got this ridiculous massive boost of upper mid-range in the bass. By the time the whole track um, got to this point, it was so ambient and so huge that I wasn't really hearing the fingers on the bass, you know, the right hand. And I really wanted to hear the attack and the aggression in the bass, even though this is a peaceful, beautiful song. So I really cranked up all of this upper mid-range rock and roll kind of frequencies. And I did kind of a dip at 100 hertz because it was a, a little boomy. Let me see if we can just go back and I'll play that and you'll see what's happening in the compression. I think it's pretty mild. Yeah just taking the top off of it. But console one is an amazing tool for mixing. And you'll see that now that we're in the actual mix session, I'll be using the console one a lot more than the other sessions, which were more of like sound world building. Let me back up. I'm gonna turn everyone back on again and you'll just hear how those chords come in. Let's get our mistress space, whirlpool. And then we have that signature riff that sort of happened in the Whirlpool session. And the Mr. Space is building from here on out in intensity. So it became this really powerful push and pull from these really low bass notes and these shimmering harmonics and the the phrases that happen in between them and a chord like that really adds a question mark to what's happening because um, this song is about power and strength but also about healing and nurturing forces all at the same time So what happens now, you can see there's some automation here in the Whirlpool track because I wanted to filter out almost all of the Whirlpool so that you felt like the song is going away. And right when you think the song is going away, the next part starts. And we've arrived. So this ascending phrase is kind of low mid-range and I'm using a quarter note delay so the notes are sort of stacking on top of each other. So even though the phrase is ascending, um, you're hearing the whole thing kind of in a messy way, but in a beautiful way, compound on itself. And it sounds like this. So everything's happening on the quarter notes but it's almost making chords within itself because of the repeats. And I love doing that. Now, the reason that there are two of these purple guys alternating is that I changed the delay time on every other one so that you got this sort of half note um, syncopated sound, which sounds like this. It's on the right channel and it's pretty subtle, but uh, let's check it out. So in the mix, I don't know if these kind of details are really noticed, but when I listen to it, it makes me feel like the song is progressing and evolving. Music like this is so simple and uses so few sounds that it's important for me for it to always evolve. And I think that's why I started whirlpooling years and years ago is because looping was on and off and there was no, there was no evolution. There was no growth. It wasn't organic. Um, 
So I take that sort of drive and I put it into all other aspects of the music I make. Because even though the music is really simple and ambient, it needs to continually grow and and have a spirit to really get you emotionally involved. So I think those details count, and that's just um, how I make music. So after these ascending guys, I've got this higher phrase that is descending, which complements the uh, other guy. And it sounds like this. And it turns around every fourth repeat and plays a higher note, which kind of plays into what the purple guy is doing. Now you'll notice that whole um, high descending thing is almost, you know, in fact, I think it's mono. Everything was sounding so big. I was struggling with producing and mixing it because we have the mistress space, even though it has a lot of depth of field and front to back and distance and, um, and echoes that go to the outside. You've also got the whirlpool, which has quite a bit of body to it. And then I've got this purple guy doing these beautiful stereo delayed phrases. By the time I got here and added this descending phrase, it was just too big. So I actually, it is mono. Yeah. So I took an ozone imager and I just slammed it all the way down because otherwise, uh, it would sound like this if it was full stereo. Way on the outside. And a lot of that delay came from the Strymon timeline pedal that I was using when I recorded all this stuff. Almost all the delays you're hearing are not coming from the session. They were actually recorded analog um, without board. So anyway, I took that phrase and collapsed it 100% to mono because there's plenty of bigness happening in the track at this point. But I did send it to what I have as bus seven and eight. So I've got a pair of these delays, which are from Universal Audio. Now these are a very, very accurate, almost too accurate in my opinion, um, recreation of the Korg SDD 3000 um, delay from the 80s, which is the delay that Brian Eno and Daniel Lanois used on the unforgettable fire by U2. So I'm I'm really going for it by using these delays, but there is a very specific thing that happens in the modulation of these delays that just it hits me. You know, I think I was listening to U2 when I was really young as a teenager and it's it's still formative for me. So I hear that sound and I get really juiced up about it. So um even though this pink part is in mono, it's sending to these left and right uh delays. So let's move on. Um, the only thing that's doing melodic content is this red guy, which I just improvised some phrases. And because at this point, the song in my mind was so busy, I think I ended up playing phrases that had a lot of space um, and lonely phrases because we're, we haven't gotten to the third act, which is kind of the resolve. I really wanted to question what is happening and I wanted it to feel powerful but kind of sexy at the same time um, and I, I believe this red track is just as it was recorded yeah the only thing that's on it is a console one and even that all that's on it is a little bit of compression and some gain so interestingly this red track is exactly as it was recorded right out of the pedal board <laughs> So I'm leaving a lot of space because there's so much happening in between. In addition to all the ambience we created in the beginning. And I didn't know what I was going to play. Just like in creating the Whirlpool, I knew what my tempo was, but I just pressed record and I just played and whatever came out, dictated what came after it and so on and so forth. So when you put everything together, when this red guy comes in, it's kind of the completion of the track in its most fullest form happens right here.
And then I wanted to evolve the emotion a little bit here, but still stay dark and kind of lonely and hollow. And here comes my favorite point in the entire track when this harmonic strum comes in right here. That's it. That's all I need. My favorite part of the song. I could listen to this stuff forever. So we keep going a little bit more. We have one more harmonic strum and then the whole thing just falls off a cliff and lets go. So I just released everybody and everything just falls off a cliff and then we dissolve back into the mistress space and the whirlpool and then we have these orange guys come in which I it's kind of my prayer to the sea. So from here on out is um these improvised, widely spaced intervals played on the guitar. The low note and the high note of each of these chords were played together. And this is just recorded right out of the pedal board. Um, the reason I have them staggered in three tracks is I really wanted all of the release and the decay of the previous chord to stay there. So I sort of overlap all the tracks. So now I'm actually playing little um, phrases on the harmonics that are rhythmic like this one so we end with this sort of prayer kind of a, a musical feeling and these really beautiful, super affected, massive delays on these harmonic strums. The phase mistress, the whirlpool, it's all happening together at the same time. And I, I felt like, I, I knew this was gonna be the last song in the album. And I knew that for those of you that are listening from an album from head to toe, having an experience, listening with headphones with your eyes closed, listening in your home stereo, or just sitting wherever you listen that it was important to set you down in a place that felt safe and resolved but at the same time still has that powerful sort of lingering danger that is always in the ocean so it sort of sums up the concept of the album but hopefully leaves you in a place that you feel resolved and content and relaxed and possibly somehow changed compared to when you went in and listened to the first song, which is Free Dive. So uh, things fade out, things get dark and they collapse and eventually let go. I'm not gonna play the rest of the song. This has been a long enough walkthrough already. Um, thank you guys so much for your interest in this, especially for all of you that interacted on social and said, hey, I wanna hear the heart of us. I wanna hear B, I wanna hear the Black Rock. Um, it's really cool that you guys are interested in this and all of you that are out there streaming this and buying this and listening to it and most of all sharing it. You're sharing this music with, with people that are in your circles and it's really reaching a lot of hungry ears and that is why I make the music. So thank you for tuning in, um, please, Subscribe to my channel, click the thumbs up if you like what you're seeing, and I would love to see any comments here on YouTube. If you like what you're seeing, if you wanna see more of something else, less of something, if you'd like to see me do this again in the future, just let me know because um, this is the first time I've done anything like this, and uh, I love sharing it with you, but I would love some feedback. So thank you so much, and we'll catch you next time. <laughs>